took three policemen to knock each down, four to put him in chains. I ain't done nothing, he shouted once they got him into the jail cell. But he was speaking only to the air they had left behind. He'd never seen people walk away so quickly, and he knew he had scared them. H rattled the bars, certain that he could bend or break them if only he tried. Stop that before they kill you, his cellmate said. H recognized the man from around town. Maybe he'd even sharecropped with him once on one of the many country farms. Can nobody kill me, H said. He was still pressing on the bars, and he couldn't hear the and he could hear the metal start to give between his fingers. Then he could feel the cellmate's hands on his shoulder. H turned around so quick, the other man didn't have time to move or think before H had lifted him by the throat. H was over six feet tall, and he had the man so high up, his head brushed the top of the ceiling. If H lifted him any higher, he would have broken through. Don't you touch me again, H said. You think them white folks won't kill you? The man said, his words coming out small and slow. What I done, H said. He lowered the man to the ground, and he fell to his knees, gasping up long sips of breath. Say you was studying a white woman. Who say? The police. Heard him talking about what to say before they went to get you. H sat down next to the man. Who they say I was talking to? Cora Hobbs. I wasn't studying no Hobbs, girl, H said. His rage lit anew. If there were rumors about him and a white woman, he would have hoped it would have been someone prettier than his old sharecropping boss's daughter. Boy, look at ya, his cellmate said, cellmate said, his gaze so spiteful now that H grew suddenly inexplicably afraid of the smaller, older man. Don't matter if it were if you was or you wasn't. All they gotta say is you was. That's all they gotta do. You think cause you all big and muscled up you safe? Nah, them white folks can't stand the sight of you, walking around free as can be. Don't nobody wanna see a black man looking like you walking proud as a peacock? Like you ain't got a lick of fear in you? He rested his head against the cell wall and closed his eyes for a second. How old you was when the war ended? H tried to count back, but he never been very good at numbers. And the Civil War was so long ago that the numbers climbed higher than H could reach. Not sure. About 13, I reckon, he said. Mm-hmm. See, that's what I thought. You was young. Slavery ain't nothing but a dot in your eye, huh? If nobody tell you, I'ma tell you. War may be over, but it ain't ended. The man closed his eyes again. He let his head roll against the wall this way, then that. He looked tired, and H wondered how long he'd been sitting in that cell. My name's H, he finally said, a peace offering. H ain't no kind of name, his cellmate said, never opening his eyes. It's the only one I got, H said. Soon, the man fell asleep. H listened to him snore, watched the rise and fall of his chest. The day the war ended, H had left his old master's plantation and began to walk from Georgia to Alabama. He'd wanted new sights and sounds to go with his newfound freedom. He was so happy to be free. Everyone knew. Everyone he knew was just happy to be free. But it didn't last long. H spent the next four days in the county jail. On the second day, the guards took his cellmate away. He didn't know where. When they finally came for H, the guards wouldn't tell him what the charge was, only that he had to pay the $10 fine by the end of the night. I only got $5 saved, H said. It had taken him nearly 10 years of sharecropping to put away that much. Maybe your family can help, the chief deputy said, but he was already walking away onto the next person. Ain't got no family, H said to no one. He had made the walk from Georgia to Alabama by himself. He was used to being alone. But Alabama had turned H's loneliness into something like a physical presence. He could hold it when he went to bed at night. It was the handle of his hoe, the puffs of cotton that floated away. He was 18 when he met his woman, Effie. By the time he got so big that by that time he had gotten so big that no one ever crossed him. He could walk into a room and watch it clear as men and women made way for him. But Effie always stood her ground. She was the most solid woman he'd ever met, and his relationship with her was the longest he'd had a relationship with anyone at all. He would have asked for her help now, but she hadn't talked to him since the day he called her by another woman's name. He had been wrong to cheat on her, wronger still to lie. He couldn't call Effie now, not with the shame hanging over him. He had heard of black women coming to the jailhouse to look for their sons or husbands or being taken back into a room by the policeman, told there were other ways to pay a fine. No, H thought, Effie would be better off without him. By sunrise the next morning, on a sweltering day in 1880, H was chained to 10 other men and sold by the state of Alabama to work the coal mines just outside of Birmingham. Next, Pit Boss shouted, and the chief deputy showed, shoved H in front of him. H had been watching them check each of the 10 men who had been chained to him on the train ride there. H wasn't even sure he could call some of them men. He saw a boy no older than 12, shivering in the corner of the train. When they pushed that boy in front of the pit boss, he peed himself, tears running down his face all the while until he looked like he himself would melt down into a puddle of wet at his feet. 
The boy was so young, he'd probably never seen a whip like the one the pit boss had laid out on his desk, only heard about them in the nightmarish stories his parents told. He's a big one, ain't he? The chief, chief deputy said, squeezing H's shoulders so that the pit boss could see how firm they were. H was the tallest, strongest man in the room. He had spent the whole train ride trying to figure out a way to break his chains. The pit boss whistled. He got out of his chair and circled H. He grabbed H's arm, and H lunged at him before his shackles stopped him. He hadn't been able to break the chains, but he knew if his hands could only reach, it wouldn't take him but a second to snap the pit boss's neck. Hoo-hoo, the pit boss said. Looks like we'll have to teach this one some manners. How much do you want for him? Twenty dollars a month, the deputy said. Now, you know we don't pay more than eighteen, even for first-class man. You said yourself he's a big one. This one will last you a while, I bet. Won't die in the mines like the others. Y'all can't do this! H shouted. I'm free, he said. I'm a free man. Nah, the pit boss said. He looked at H carefully and pulled out a knife from the inside of his coat. He began to sharpen the knife against an iron stone he kept on his desk. Ain't no such thing as a free N-word. He walked up slowly to H. He held the sharpened knife against his neck so that H could feel the cold, rigid edge of it begging to break skin. The pit boss turned to Ch Chief Deputy. We'll give you 19 for this one, he said. Then he ran the tip of the knife slowly across H's neck. A thin line of blood appeared, neat and straight, as if to underline the pit boss's words. He may be big, but he'll bleed just like the rest of them. It had never occurred to H during those many years that he worked on plantations that there was anything more than dirt and water, bugs and roots under the earth. Now he saw that there was an entire city underground, larger, more sprawling than any country that H had ever lived in or worked in. And this city was occupied almost entirely by black men and boys. The city had shafts for streets, rooms for houses, and in every room everywhere there was coal. The first thousand pounds of coal were the hardest to shovel. H spent hours, whole days on his knees. By the end of the first month, the shovel felt like an extension of his arm, and indeed his back had begun to ripple around the shoulder blades, growing, it seemed, to accommodate the new height. With the shovel arm, H and the other men were lowered some 650 feet down to the shaft into the mine. Once the underground city, once in the underground city, they traveled three, five, seven miles to the coal face where they were to work that day. H was large but nimble. He could lie on his flank and shinny himself into nooks and crannies. He could crawl on his hands and knees through tunnels and exploded rock until he got to the right room. Once he reached the room, H shoveled some 14,000 pounds of coal, all while stooped down low on his knees, stomach, sides. And when he and the other prisoners left the mines, they would always be coated in a black in a layer of black dust, their arms burning, just burning. Sometimes H thought that that burning pain would set the coal on fire and they would all die down there from the pain of it. But he knew it wasn't just pain that could kill a man in the mine. More than once, a prison warden had whipped a miner for not reaching the 10-ton quota. H had seen a third-class man shovel 11,829 pounds of coal, weighed in at the end of the workday by the pit boss. And when the pit boss had seen the missing 171 pounds, he had made the man put his hands up against the cave wall, and then he'd be whip he whipped him until he died. And the white wardens did not move him that night or the rest of the next day, leaving the dust to blanket his body, a warning to the other convicts. Other times, mine stopes had been collapsed, burying the prisoners alive. Too many times, dust explosions would wipe out men and children by the hundreds. One day, H would be working beside a man he had been chained to the night before, the next time, day, the man would have died of God only knew what. H used to fantasize about moving to, to Birmingham. He had been a sharecropper since the war ended. And he'd heard that Birmingham was a place a black man could make a life for himself. He wanted to move there and finally start living. But what kind of life was this? At least when he was a slave, his master had needed to keep him alive if he wanted to get his money's worth. Now, if H died, they would just lease the next man. A mule was worth more than he was. H could hardly remember being free. He could not tell if what he missed was the freedom itself or the capacity for memory. Sometimes when he made it back to the bunk, he shared with 50-something men, all shackled together on long wooden bends so that they wouldn't move until they, while they slept unless they moved together. He would try to remember remembering. He would force himself to think of all the things in his mind, would still call up. Effie, mostly. Her thick body, the look in her eyes when he called her by another name. How scared he was to lose her. How sorry. Sometimes, as he slept in the chains would rub against his ankles in such a way that he would remember the feeling of Effie's hands there, which always surprised him, since metal was nothing like skin. The convicts working the mines were almost all like him, black, once slave, once free, now slave again. Timothy, a man on H's chain link, had been arrested outside a house where he built after the war. 
A dog had been howling in a nearby field the whole night long, and Timothy had stepped out to tell the dog to hush up. The next morning, the police had arrested him for causing a disturbance. There was also Solomon, a convict who had been arrested for stealing a nickel. His sentence was 20 years. Occasionally, one of the wardens would bring in a white third-class man. A new prisoner would be chained to a black man, and for the first few minutes, all that white prisoner would do was complain. He'd say that he was better than the N-words. He'd beg his white brothers, the wardens, to have mercy on him, spare him from the shame of it all. He'd curse and cry and carry on, and then they would have to go down into the mine, and that white convict would soon learn that if he wanted to live, he would have to put his faith in a black man. H had once been partnered with a white third-class na man named Thomas, whose arms had started shaking so badly he couldn't lift the shovel. It was Thomas's first week. But he'd already heard that if you didn't make your quota, you and your buddy would be whipped, sometimes to death. H had watched Thomas's trembling arms fit, uh, lift a few pounds of coal before giving way, and then Thomas had collapsed onto the ground, crying, stammering that he didn't want to die down there with nothing but N-words to bear witness. Wordlessly, H had taken up Thomas's shovel, with his own shovel in one hand and Thomas's shovel in the other, H had filled both men's quotas, the pit boss watching all the while. Ain't no man ever shoveled double-handed before, the boss had said after it was over, respecting respect lacing his voice. And H had simply nodded. The pit boss had then kicked Thomas on the ground where he sat, sniveling. That N-word just saved your life, he said. Thomas looked up at H, and H said nothing. That night, in a bunk with two other men chained on either end of him, a bunk two feet above him, H realized that he couldn't move his arms. What's wrong? Joycey asked, noticing H's awkward stillness. Can't feel my arms, H whispered, scared. Josie nodded. I don't want to die, Josie. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. H could not stop himself from repeating the words, and soon he realized that he was crying too, and he couldn't stop that either. The coal dust under his eyes started to run down his face, and silently H continued on. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Hush now, Joycey said, hugging H to his body as best as he could while the chains clanking and clanking as he moved. Ain't nobody dying tonight, not tonight. The two men looked around to see if others had woken up from the noise. Everyone had heard about how H had saved the white third-class man, but they all knew, too, that this didn't mean the pit boss would show mercy. The next day, H would have to do his share all over again. The next day, H was assigned to the morning shift, partnered up with Thomas. He and the other morning shift men woke up while the moon was still bright in the sky, sliced thin and arched upward as though it was the crooked, white-toothed smile of the dark-skinned night. They went over to the mess hall to get a cup of coffee, coffee and a slab of meat. They got a sack lunch to take with them, and then they were lowered on some 200 feet down be below the earth's surface until they hit the belly of the mine. From there, H and Thomas continued two miles in, further down, stopping finally in the room of the mine where they were to work that day. Usually, there were only two men in a room, but this one was particularly difficult, and the pit boss had paired H and Thomas with Joycey and his third-class man, a convict called Bull, who had gotten his name, not because of his fame, stocky and squat and commanding, but because Klansmen had burned his face one night, branded him, they said, so that everyone would know he was no good. H had gone through all the emotions of that morning his arms achingly anchored to his sides as he refused the coffee and meat, couldn't pick up the lunch sack to hold it, shimmied into the elevator shaft. He had made it through the morning without drawing attention, trying to save up his energy for when he would have to start working. Joycey was the cutter that day. He was five feet, four inches tall, a small man, but he understood the ways of the rock like no one H had ever worked with did. Joycey was a first-class man they all respected, working off seven of his eight-year sentence as fervently as he had year one. He would often say how he was going to get free and start working in the mines for pay, as some of the other black men had done. They couldn't whip a free miner. That day, the space between the rock was only about a foot high. H had seen men wiggle into spaces that small and shake and hyperventilate so badly they needed to leave. Once he'd seen a man try to get to the very middle and then stop, too scared to move forward or backward, too scared to breathe. They called Joycey over to try to fish him out, but by the time he got there, the man had already died. Joycey didn't even blink at the small space. He shimmied his small body under the rock and laid down on his back to start undercut the bottom of the scene. Once he had finished that, he drove a hole into the rock, listening to it, he liked to say, so that he could find the right spot that wouldn't crumble on top of him and kill him straight away. Once the hole had been placed, Joycey put in the dynamite in, lit it. But the, the coal blew apart, and Thomas and Bull picked up their picks and started breaking the rock into manageable pieces so that they could all start to load the tram car. H tried to lift his shovel but his arms would not budge. He tried again, focusing all his mind's power and energy on his shoulder, his forearm, his wrist, his fingers. Nothing happened. At first, Bull and Thomas just stared at him. 
But before he knew it, Joycey was shoveling his pile for him, and then Bull, and then finally, after what seemed like hours, Thomas, too, was pulling weight, until everyone in the room of that mine was shoveling his own pile and H's, too. Thank you for your help the other day, Thomas said once they had finished. H's arms were still aching at his sides. They felt like immovable stone, forced to stay at his sides by some gravitational pull. H nodded at Thomas. He used to dream about killing white men the way they killed black men. He used to dream of ropes and whips, trees and mine shafts. Hey, how come they call you H? Don't know, H said. He used to think of nothing else but escaping the mines. Sometimes he would study the underground city and wonder if there was somewhere, some way he could break free, come out on another side. Come on, someone must have named you. My old masters say H is what my mama used to call me. They asked her to name me something proper before she gave birth, but she refused. She killed herself. Master said they had to slice me out of her belly before she died. Thomas didn't say anything then, just nodded his thank you again. A month later, when Thomas died of tuberculosis, H couldn't remember his name, only the face that he made when H had picked up his shovel for him. This was how it went in the mines. H didn't know where Bull was now. So many were transferred at one point or another, contracted by one of the new companies or absorbed by another. It was easy to make friends, but impossible to keep them. Last H had heard, Joycey was finishing his sentence, and now all the convicts had told stories about how their old friend had finally become one of those free miners they had all heard about but never dreamed of actually becoming. H shoveled his last thousand pounds of coal as a convict in 1889. He had been working in Rock Slope for almost all of his incarceration, and his hard work and skill had shaved a year off his sentence. The day the elevator shaft took him up to the light, and the prison warden unshackled his feet, H looked straight up at the sun, storing up the rays, just in case some cruel trick sent him back to the city underground. He didn't stop staring until the sun turned into a dozen yellow spots in his eyes. He thought about going back home, but realized that he didn't know where home was. There was nothing left for him on the old plantations he'd worked, and he had no family to speak of. On the first night of his second freedom, he walked as far as he could, walked until there was no mine in sight, no smell of coal clinging to his nostrils. He entered the first bar he had saw that contained black people, and with the little money he had, he ordered a drink. He had showered that morning, tried to rub the clench marks of the shackles from his ankles, the soot from underneath his nails. He had stared at himself in the mirror until he was confident that no one could tell he had ever been in a mine. Sipping his drink, H noticed a woman. All he could think was that her skin was the color of cotton stems, and he missed that blackness, having only the true blackness of coal for nearly ten years. Excuse me, miss, could you tell me where I am? he asked. He hadn't spoken to a woman since the day he had called Ethy by another woman's name. You ain't looked like at the sign before you came in, she asked, smiling. I reckon I ain't, he asked, or said. You and Pete's bar, Mr. H is my name. Mr. H is my name. They talked for an hour. He found out her name was Dinah and she lived in Mobile, but was visiting a cousin there in Birmingham, a very Christian woman who would not care to see her kin drinking. H had just gotten about gotten it into his head to ask her to marry him when another man stepped in to join them. You look mighty strong, the man said. H nodded. I suppose I am. How you got to be so strong, the man asked, and H shrugged. Go on, the man said. Roll up your sleeve. Show us some muscle. H started laughing, but then he looked at Dinah, and her eyes were twinkling in the way that said maybe she wouldn't mind seeing and so he rolled up his sleeve. At first, both people were nodding appreciatively, but then the man came closer. What's that? He said, tugging where the sleeve met H's back until he'd made a rent in the fabric, and the whole cheap thing tore loose. Dear Lord, Dinah said, covering her mouth. H craned his neck, trying to look at his own back, but he remembered and he knew he didn't need to. It had been nearly 25 years since the end of slavery, and free men were not supposed to have fresh scars on their back, the evidence of a whip. I knew it. The man said, I knew there was one of them cons from over at the mines. Ain't nothing else it could be. Dinah, don't you waste any more time talking to this N-word. She didn't. She walked away with the man to stand on the other side of the bar. H rolled his sleeve back down and knew that he couldn't go back to the free world, marked as he was. He moved to Pratt City, a town that was made up of ex-cons, white and black alike, convict miners who were now free miners. His first night there, he asked around for a few minutes till he found Joycey, along with his wife and children, who had moved out to Pratt City to be with him. Ain't you got no one, Joycey's wife said, frying up some salt pork for H, working hard to make up for the fact that he had not eaten a good meal for ten years, maybe more. Had a woman named Ethy long ago, but I reckon she ain't going to want him here for me now. The wife gave him a piteous look, and H figured she was thinking she knew the whole story of Ethy, having married a man herself before the white man had come and labeled him Con. Little Joe, the wife called, over and over until the child appeared. This is our son, Little Joe, she said. He know how to write. 
Joe H. looked him over. He couldn't have been more than 11 years old. He was knobby-kneed and clear-eyed. He looked up just like he looked just like his father, but he was different too. Maybe he wouldn't end up the kind of man who needed to use his body for work. Maybe he'd be a new kind of black man altogether, one who just got to use his mind. He gonna write you woman, the wife said. Nah, H said, thinking about how Effie had fled the room the last time they were together. Fled like a spirit was chasing her. Ain't no need. The wife cluck, clicked her tongue twice, three times. I ain't gonna hear none of that, she said. Somebody gotta know you free now. Somebody in this world gotta need to know at least that. With all due respect, ma'am, I got myself, and that's all I ever needed. Joyce's wife looked at him long and hard, and H could see the pity and anger in that look, but he didn't care. He didn't back down, and so finally, she had to. The next morning, H walked with Joycey over to the mine to ask for work as a free laborer. The boss man was called Mr. John. He asked H to take off a shirt. He inspected the muscles on his back and his arms and whistled. Any man that can spend 10 years working at Rock Slope and live to tell about it is worth the watching. Made some deal with the devil, have you? Mr. John asked, looking at H with his piercing blue eyes. Just a hard worker, sir, Joycey said. Hard and smart, too. You vouch for him, Joycey? Mr. John asked. Ain't none better but me, Joycey said. H left with a pick in his hands. Pratt City life was not easy, but it was better than living the living H had known anywhere else. He had never seen anything like it before. White men and their families next door to black men and theirs. Both colors joining the same unions, fighting for the same things. The Mayans had taught them that they had to rely on each other if they wanted to survive, and they had taken that mentality with them when they started the camp because they knew no one but a fellow miner, an ex-con, knew what it was like to live in Birmingham and try to make something of a past where you would sooner forget. The work H did was the same, only now he got paid for it. Proper wages, for he had but once been a first-class man contracted by coal companies from the state prison for $19 a month. Now that money went into his own pocket, sometimes as much as $40 in a single month. He remembered what little he had saved sharecropping for two years at the Hobbs Plantation, and he knew that in some dark and twisted way, the mine was one of the best things that had happened to him. It had taught him a new skill, a worthy one, and his hands would never have to pick cotton or till land ever again. Joycey and his wife, Jane, had been gracious enough to let H move in with them, but H tried living off and around other people and their families. So he spent a better part of his first month in Pratt City, coming from the mine and headed straight to the plot of land next to Joycey's place to start building his own house. H was out there one night hammering wood when Joycey came to see him. Why ain't you joined the union yet? Joycey asked. We could use somebody with your temper. He had gotten good lumber from another old, old friend from the mine, and the only time he could work on building the house was between 8 p.m. and 3 a.m. And every other waking hour, he's down in the mines. I ain't like that no more. H said, though he had no scar on his neck from the day the pit boss had sliced him, he still ran his hands there from time to time as a reminder that the white men could still kill him for nothing. Oh, you ain't like that, huh? Come on, H, we fighting for things you could use too. Ain't nobody, you, ain't like, no, you got anybody to keep you company in this house you're building. Union might do you some good. H sat in the very back of the first meeting he ever went to, his arms folded. At the front of the room, a doctor spoke to them about black lung disease. The mineral dust that covers the outside of your bodies when you leave, well, that gets inside your body too, makes you sick. Shorter hours, better ventilation, those are things you should be fighting for. It had taken about a month, but it wasn't just Joycey's talk that finally convinced H to join. The truth was he was scared of dying in the mines, and his freedom had not erased his fear. Every time H was lowered down into the mine, he would picture his own death. Men were getting diseases he had never before seen or heard of, but now that he was free, he could make the danger worth something. More money is what we should be fighting for, H said. The murmur started to pass through the room as people craned their necks to see who had spoken. Two Shovel H is here. Is that Two Shovel? He gone so long without attending a meeting. Ain't no way to keep from breathing the dust, Doc, H said. Hell, most men in this woman are ha our room are halfway to death as it is. Might as well get paid before we go. Behind H, the meeting door started to rustle, and a child who had his leg blown off hobbled in. He couldn't have been more than 14 years old, but already H felt he could picture the entire course of that boy's life. Maybe he'd start out as a breaker, sitting hunched over tons of coal, trying to separate it from slate and rock. Then maybe the bosses moved him up to Sprager because they saw him running outside one day and knew that he was fast. The boy had to run along the cars, jamming Sprague's in the wheels to slow the cars down, but maybe one car didn't slow down. Maybe that one car jumped the track and took the boy's leg and his whole future with it. Maybe what saddened the boy most after Dr. Sodded off was the fact that he would never get to be a first-class miner like his father. The doctor looked down from H to the crippled boy and back again. 
Money's nice, don't get me wrong, but mining can be a whole lot safer than it is. Lives are worth fighting for, too. He cleared his throat, then continued to speak about the science of black lung. On his walk home that night, H started to think about the crippled boy, how easy it had been for H to make up his story, how easy it was for a life to go one way instead of another. He could still remember telling his cellmate that nothing could kill him, how he had seen his mortality, and now he had seen his mortality all around him. What if H hadn't been so arrogant when he was a younger man? What if he hadn't been arrested? What if he'd been treating, traded by his woman right? He should had, have had children on his, of his own by now. He should have had a small farm and a full life. Suddenly, H felt like he couldn't breathe, like that decade's worth of dust was climbing up his lungs and into his throat and choking him. He hunched over and started to cough and cough and cough, and when he finished coughing, he stumbled his way to Joyce's house and knocked on the door. Little Joe answered with sleep in his eyes. My daddy ain't back from the meeting yet, Uncle H, he said. I ain't here to see your daddy, son. I, I need you to write me a letter. Can you do that? Little Joe nodded. He went to the house and came back out with the supplies he needed. He wrote as H dictated. Dear Ethy, this is H. I am now free living in Pratt City. H mailed the letter the very next morning. What we need to do is call a strike, a white union member said. H was sitting in the front row of the church house where the union meetings were held. There was an endless list of problems and the, the strike was the first solution. H listened carefully as a murmur of agreement began to rush through the room, as hushed as a hum. Who going to pay attention to our strike, H said. He was becoming more vocal at the meetings. Well, we tell them we won't work until they raise our pay or make it safer. They got to listen, the white man said. H snorted. When a white man ever listened to a black man? I'm here now, ain't I? I'm listening, the white man said. You a con. You're a con too. H looked back around the room. There are about 50 men there, over half of them black. What you done wrong? H asked, returning his gaze to the white man. At first, the man wouldn't speak. He kept his head lowered and cleared his throat so many times, H wondered if there was anything left in his mouth all the time, at, at all. Finally, the words came out. I killed a man. Killed a man, huh? You know what they got my friend Joycey over there for? He ain't crossed the street when a white woman walked by. For that, they gave him nine years. For killing a man, they gave you the same. We ain't cons like you. We got to work together now, the white man said. Same as in the mine. We can't be one way down there and another way up here. No one spoke. They all just turned to watch H, see what he would say or do. Everyone had heard the story of the time he'd picked up that second shovel. Finally, he nodded, and the next day, the strike began. Only 50 people showed up on that first day. They gave their bosses a list of their demands, better pay, better care for the sick, and fewer hours. The white union members had written up the list, and Joycey's boy, Little Joe, had read it aloud to all the black members to make sure that it said what they thought it said. The bosses had answered back that free miners could easily be replaced by convicts. And one week later, a carriage full of black cons appeared, all under the age of 16, and looking so scared, made H want to quit the strike if it only meant more people wouldn't be arrested to fill the gap. By the end of the week, the only thing both sides had agreed to was that there would be no killing. And still, more convicts were rounded up and brought in. H wondered if there was a black man left in the South who hadn't been put in prison at one point or another. So many of them came to fill the mines. Even free laborers who weren't striking were being replaced. So soon, more of them joined in the fight. H spent hours at Joycey and Jane's house making signs with Little Joe. What they say, H asked, pointing to the tar-painted wood at Little Joe's side. It says, it's a more pay, the boy answered. And what that say? It say, no more tuberculosis. Where you learn to read like that, H said. He had grown so fond of Little Joe, but the sight of his friend's only son made him ache for a child of his own. The smell of the tar Little Joe was using to write clung to the hairs of H's nostrils. He coughed a little, and the black sting of, string of mu mucus trailed out of his mouth. I had a little school in Huntsville before they took my daddy. When they arrested him, they said me and my whole family was getting too uppity. They said that's why my daddy didn't cross the street when the white woman passed by. And what do you think? H asked. Little Joe shrugged. The next day, Joycey and H took the signs out with them to the strike. There were about 150 men standing out in the cold. They all watched while the new crop of cons walked by, waiting to be lowered in the mines. Let them kids go! H shouted loudly. A boy had peed himself, waiting for the shaft, and H remembered the one who had been chained to him as they rode the train over, who had wet himself and cried endlessly when they stood before the pit boss. They ain't but kids. Let, let him go. Are you going to stop this foolishness and get back to work? Came the reply. Then suddenly, the boy who had wet himself started to run. He was nothing but a blur in the corner of H's eye before the gunshot went off. And the people on strike broke the line, swarming the few white bosses who were standing guard. They broke the shafts and dumped the coal from the tram cars before breaking those two. H grabbed a white man by the throat and held him over the vast pit. 
One day the world going to know what you've done here, he said to the man, whose fears were written plainly across his blue eyes, bulging now that H's grip had tightened. H wanted to throw the man down, down to meet the city underneath the earth, but he stopped himself. He was not the con they had told him he was. It took six more months of striking for the bosses to give in. They would all be paid 50 cents more. The running boy was the only one to die in the struggle. The pay increase was a small victory, but one they would all have to take. After the day the boy, running boy died, the strikers helped clean up the mess the fight had made. They picked up their shovels, found the boy who had been gunned down, and buried him in the potter's field. H wasn't sure what the others were thinking when they finally laid the boy to rest among the hundreds of other cons who had died there, nameless, but he knew that he was thankful. After the union meeting, where the raise was announced, H walked home with Joycey. He saw his friend off to his house, and then he went to the next door to his own. When he got there, he saw that his front door was swinging open, and a strange smell was coming from inside. He still had his pick on him, caked with the dirt and the coal from the mine. He lifted the pick over his head, certain that a pit boss had come to meet him. He crept in lightly, ready for whatever came next. It was Effie, apron tied around her waist and handkerchief wrapped around her head. She turned from the stove where she was cooking greens and faced him. You might as well set that thing down, she said. H looked at his hands. The pick was raised just slightly above his head, and he lowered it to the side and then to the floor. I got your letter, Effie said, and H nodded. And the two of them just stood there and stared at each other for a moment before Effie found her voice again. Had to get Miss Benton from up the street to read it for me. First, I just let it sit there on my table. Every day I'd pass it and I'd think about what I was going to do. I let two months go by that way. The fat back at the bottom of the pot started to crackle. H didn't know if Effie could hear it because she had not looked away from him, nor he from her. You have to understand, H. The day you call me that woman's name, I thought, ain't I been through enough? Ain't just about everything I ever had been taken away from me? My freedom, my family, my body, and now I can't even get my own name. Ain't I deserve to be Effie to you, at least, if nobody else? My mama gave me that name herself, and I spent six good years with her before they sold me out to Louisiana to work them sugar canes. All I have of her then was my name. That was all I had of myself, too, and you wouldn't even give me that. Smoke began to form above the pot. It rose higher and higher until a cloud of it was dancing around Effie's head, kissing her lips. I wasn't ready to forgive you for that for a long time. And by the time I was, the white folks was already paying you back for something I know you ain't done, but nobody would tell me how I could get you out. And what was I supposed to do then? Ain't you tell me. What was I supposed to do then? As he turned away from him and went to the pot. She began scraping the bottom of it, and the stuff she lifted up with a spoon was about as black as H had any, anything H had ever seen. He went to her, took her body in his arms, let himself feel the full weight of her. It was not the same weight as coal, but that mountain of black rock that he had spent nearly a third of his life lifting, Effie did not submit so easily. She did not lean back into him until the pot had been scraped clean. <laughs>